All right, everybody, my name is Bill Pat. I work with the South Orange County Wastewater Authority as their uh, supervising maintenance mechanic. I've been in the industry for 10 years. I have roped into being a track facilitator. This is my first time, so please bear with me. Um, we will be doing the assembly and disassembly of pump basics. I got Mr. Ron Aceto as our instructor today. Ron is the municipal markets manager for Cornell Pump Company in Plaquemines, Oregon. He brings almost 40 years experience in the pump industry, ranging from field service technician, service management, applications and sales engineering, systems troubleshooting, maintenance and design, technical trainer, as well as national sales and marketing management. Ron has extensive experience in commercial, industrial, and wastewater markets, and a vast array of pumping technologies, including centripetal, offshore displacement, turbines, and more. He has presented at numerous water environmental technical conferences throughout the U.S. and Canada over the last 15 years. Ron has been with Cornell Pumps for over six years and has served as the regional manager and moved to the position as municipal market manager in his second year with Cornell. His knowledge of not only pumps, but the systems in which they operate brings great value to the Cornell Pump family and the municipal market as a whole. So without any further ado, we're going to get started. If anybody has any questions, please just raise your hand. We want to spark questions. If you're thinking of a question, I guarantee half the other people in the room are going to be thinking the same exact thing. So if you have a question, please raise your hand. I'll walk over you and we'll, we'll get engaged. Without further ado, Ron. Thank you, Bill. Yeah, as Bill said, uh, questions at the time you've got them, throw your hand up in the air. We'll stop and ask them, to, you know, ask them at that time so we can address those issues at the time. This isn't going to be your typical, we're going to sit here with a couple of wrenches and pull a pump apart in front of you and show you the motion. A lot of people have done that. What we want to talk about is the components in a pump. Uh, I will talk about how they come apart, but why some things do what they do, what to look for in the maintenance of a pump, uh, why is it not performing properly. Pumps are really not very smart animals. You look at this thing here, it spins around. Big deal, the motor's gonna drive that. This pump is going to do nothing until you attach piping to it and fluid starts to flow through it. The system tells the pump where it's going to run because it's all the resistance in the piping, both on the suction side and the discharge side, that make this operation you know, work. So this particular pump, in wastewater, we typically operate at speeds 1,200 RPM and lower unless we're trying to do some cutting things and need to run at higher speeds and doing cutting and grinding. But the basic components of the pump, and Mike will show you down here on the floor, this is the balloon down here. Uh, it is at the suction assembly. We really didn't have piping to hang this off of for you. But you've got the pump volute. This is the casing that holds all the energy in there that builds pressure. What you see on the internal side here, this is a wear ring. Okay, most pumps will come in wastewater will come with a wear ring. We like to recommend using two. One fitted in the casing, which is stationary, and then another one would be heat shrinked onto the nose of the impeller. The reason those two things are there is because they're a sacrificial lamp. Those rings are a lot less expensive than this piece here. This could cost you $2,000. That ring could cost you $600. Normally the rings are made of a heat-treated hardened material. As I said, one would be shrink-fitted onto the nose of the impeller here. This is an enclosed impeller. There are other types of impellers we'll talk about too. The other is fitted into the casing. Now the clearance between the sides of those rings is very important because as you look in the operation of a centrifugal pump, fluid comes in the inlet, it then comes in contact with these impeller veins. Okay, and as this pump spins, the water gains or the fluid gains velocity across there. And as it picks up speed, it then comes in contact with the balloon in the casing and builds pressure. Okay, so what happens is, as that pressure builds, fluid wants to go whichever way it can, the point of least resistance. So you've got all your high pressure in between the casing here. It's going to want to try to migrate behind the impeller around the front. The purpose of those wear rings is to keep that water from recirculating right back to the eye. And that's what keeps it efficient. So when you're looking in the field as an operator, if you've got falling pressure on your discharge, you can't figure out why. The pump is running at its right speed. It's supposed to give me this much flow and this much head pressure on the discharge. If your gauges are falling off, one of the first places you want to look at is these wear rings and the tolerance between them. An operation and maintenance manual comes with every uh, centrifugal pump that comes out. 
a lot of them will have what those clearances are supposed to be. And it's different for each size of the pump. This particular pump is a four by four pump. The tolerance between those two uh, surfaces is about 20 thousandths of an inch per side. And it, as you can see, that ring was about an inch wide. So what happens is that only allows a little bit of pressure and flow to circulate back here. You want all of your energy coming through the balloon and out the discharge. Okay, so the purpose of those wear rings is to keep that fluid in the place it's supposed to be and not move back around and, and waste, flu, uh, waste flow and waste efficiency. When you see that your pressure is falling off on your discharge, Okay, that's one of the first places you want to look at. You'll take a feeler gauge, you disconnect the suction piping off of the front, and you'll see the clearance between there. And you can just take feeler gauges and measure around that and see if that gap is opened up. If you're getting a lot of recirculation around the front of the propeller, it's now time to take that impeller off and then take those wear rings off. The wear rings are really not difficult when you're installing them in a pump. The wear ring that is installed in this cover here is just set in place and then it is pounded down in with a rubber mallet, the convincer. Uh, you know, what you'll do is you'll wear, beat that into place and it will seat in, okay? To remove that wear ring, since it's pressed in there hard, you're trying to figure out how's that thing coming out. All you really need to do is we drill through the sides across from each other and make weak points there. Okay, and then we'll chisel that through, and then we'll break that wear ring out of it. Very simple to, to remove. Okay, on the wear rings on the front of the impeller, to install them, what we do is we'll put them on an electric cone that it, it heats up, and it evenly heats the wear ring and expands it to a point that will slide on there. A lot of people will just use a toaster oven if you don't have a wear, a wear ring heating cone, because they can be very big. We've got wear rings that are you know, like 20 inches in diameter. So you can put them in a small oven, heat them up, expand them, and then you drop fit them on there. Of course you want to have proper safety equipment to handle something that's running at about 400 degrees. So you want to be able to handle that and then just drop it onto the nose of the impeller. Hey Ron. Yes. Hey, uh, just a, while you're talking, something popped in my head. For the guys that actually are taking their mechanical courses, there is one question on your test is going to be, what is the difference between a clearance fit and an interference fit? So, what Ron's talking about right now, when heating that bear, or that wear ring up and putting it on there, that is an interference fit. So just keep that in mind when you take your tests. Yes, and the stationary is a, is a clearance fit. It is machined to fit inside of there, and you're forcing it in there. You're not, you know, uh, you're heating it to expand it. But it is, you need to make the clearance, as Bill said, to get it onto the end of the impeller. All right, so as we talked about trying to keep that energy from going around the front of the impeller and recirculating into the eye and losing flow on your discharge, the other thing that happens is fluid wants to come around the backside of the impeller. Okay, so what you'll see on this impeller is there is a pumping vein here. And you'll see this very commonly in wastewater pumping. Uh, what you'll see in clean water pumping or potable water pumping is holes will be drilled back here. And those are there for a purpose. They're there to balance pressure. Because you can imagine a larger pump, and some of you have some pretty large pumps in your facility. If you get a lot of fluid coming back here, all this high pressure here wants to push its way back here. Well, that wants to push that impeller toward the casing. Okay, so those loads, we, we call those axial loads. And that's the forces that try to drive that entire shaft assembly back down toward the casing. So if that were to happen, you're going to bottom this out, it's going to wear the casing, it's going to wear the impeller and cost you a lot. So what these pumping veins do, uh, Michael put a camera on it again, those veins are designed to work as additional little pumping veins that what happens is they expel the energy out from behind the back of the impeller and they reduce that pressure down to about five pounds of pressure. Now you could have a pump putting out 50 to 60 pounds of pressure, but that, those veins work so effectively uh, to reduce that pressure back there, it keeps that load from forcing things toward the casing of the pump, okay? So that is, that's the purpose of pumping veins. 
Now, when I talked about there are holes drilled back there in clean water applications sometimes, what those are designed to do is allow that pressure to relieve itself through those holes. We don't use balance holes in wastewater pumping because obviously they'll clog, okay, because you're going to have to be pumping solids and we have a lot of new different type of solids that are being uh, pushed in through there with a lot of ragging materials. Okay, so Jason, if you want to grab a couple of bars here, uh, or actually before Jason does this, what holds the impeller on? Okay, we've got an impeller bolt and a impeller washer. Okay, and I'll just pull this out real quickly. Okay, the impeller bolt, as you can see, this one's not very large. These can get pretty big. It's got a hex head inside. Okay, and the impeller washer here, they serve the purposes of holding that onto the shaft. Okay, there are different ways to fasten impellers to shafts. This one happens to be bolted on. There are some impellers that screw onto the shaft. Okay, one important thing to know, to know, if you've got a screwed on impeller, when you're checking your rotation at startup, always have your motor uncoupled from the pump. Because if you run it the wrong direction, you can possibly unscrew the impeller, push it into the casing, and when you start it up again, you're going to cross threads, and you're going to have some big problems. So always keep in mind, when you've got a screwed on impeller, you won't see this bolt hole here. It'll be just a cast cap inside of there. It'll just be cast over, and that's going to tell you that that's a screwed on impeller. Okay? Make sure when you're checking the rotation of the pump before you start it up, Check the motor rotation. Make sure it matches the arrows that are on the back of the casing that says pump goes this way. Then you can recouple it. You know you're not going to unscrew your impeller. Okay, important thing about these impeller bolts. Okay, this is the only bolt in a pump that has a torque rating, at least in centrifugal pumps like this. Everything else just bolts up, tightens up, okay, and it just keeps things clamped together. This is the only thing that has a torque rating. This particular pump might be about 95 pounds of torque to tighten this up on a smaller pump. As you get into bigger pumps like 24 inch and things like that, it's about 200 foot pounds of torque. But what happens when you torque down on a bolt like this? You stretch these threads out. Okay? If you're going to do a repair and a rebuild of a pump, buy a $25 pump. Now, you might think that's expensive for this bolt, but some of these bolts get pretty big. But make sure you buy a new impeller bolt because you could be putting back in something that's not going to mesh up with the threads inside of the shaft and it could cause loosening, which is going to lead to vibration which shortens the life of bearings and such. Okay, so that's very important. Just a simple little thing like that in maintenance is replace that impeller bolt. This impeller washer here, okay, this is not huge. It's only about three inches wide flat surface in the back. The purpose of this is to put even pressure on the impeller as you're tightening it in. We don't want to just bolt it in. So that washer is going to put even pressure inside here, okay, as you tighten up inside of there. It's a little dark to see. But as that slides onto the shaft, this is taper fit on here, locked in there pretty good. We're not going to pull this off for safety reasons and watching people's toes and don't want to scrap up, scratch up our showpiece. But, um, what that does is even the pressure there. When you want to remove the impellers, this looks like a nice heavy duty piece of iron. Okay, one of the biggest mistakes you can make when trying to pry this off, if you have a wheel puller and impeller puller, great, it's going to give you a lot more even pull. Okay, but in the field, do not go here and pry across this weak point. It will snap the back of that impeller. Okay and it's gonna cost you a lot of money and you have to wait for those parts because these are machined to a diameter, okay? What we look for you to do if you're going to pry these things apart, see this nice beefy piece here? That's where the impeller vein comes out, okay? When you want to pry here, this is where we're going. You're not gonna break this impeller by prying in these spots. And there are two across, away from each other. You'll see solids handling impellers will have two to three veins, maybe four, depending upon the size. Potable water pumps may have 12, 15 veins, okay? They're a little easier to get apart because there's not as much, you know, dirt. But make sure when removing an impeller, you pry at these strong points, 
Okay, so as that impeller would then be removed, okay, take it, clean it up properly. Always look for chips or wear. You'll see these veins can wear on an edge. You, if you see that, you're losing surface area of the impeller. If you lose surface area, you're losing performance. The diameter of the impeller is very important too. You just don't buy a pump and it's got a wheel in it and then run at a certain speed to get a certain flow. What we do is when you tell us, I need, say, 2,000 gallons a minute at 50 feet of head pressure, this pump would probably be able to give you 80, 90 feet at a certain speed. What we do is we trim the diameters of these impeller. We can also trim the angle of the impeller to, you know, affect its importance or its performance. Okay, so there's a lot of ways we can tweak these things in diameter to uh, change the flow in the head in it. 